Yeah, I mean, I think people don't make the connection. I think often we feel like the brain is not part of the body. And even people who understand (laughs) that the brain is, of course, part of the body, we think of food as something that affects our heart and our weight and our cholesterol levels. I mean, there's been so much focus over the past 50 years or so on those isolated parts of our health. And we rarely think about how food affects other aspects of our health. And of course, I've come to understand that you don't need a different diet for each part of the body. Of course, that wouldn't make any sense. All the cells need the same basic nutritional care. And all of the chemistry of the cells, uh, the components of cells come from the food we eat. Where else could they come from? A lot of people think that so much of mental health has to do with our upbringing, our experiences, our mindset, uh, you know, that, that we have a lot of control over it. I think people believe we have much more control over it through psychotherapy, for example, or through changing our environment, our relationships. And those things are very, very important. Don't get me wrong. But I think people think that that's most of it. I don't think most people realize that if you have a mental illness, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need medication. What if it's simply that you haven't been feeding your brain properly and that the chemical imbalance that you've been told you have is like so many other chronic illnesses, simply a result of eating the wrong way? And I know that sounds radical and maybe even crazy to some people, but why should the brain be any different? We now understand that so many other health problems are directly related to how we eat. Why should mental illness be any different? But a lot of the pushback comes from there not being randomized controlled trials of nutrition and mental health with very, very few exceptions. And there are some people, when a field is new, they're sort of the early adopters and the late adopters. <laughs> and so the early adopters are really excited to say, well, oh, this is really exciting. What's the harm in trying a change in diet? Think about all the possibilities. And yes, let, let's learn more and let's try it. Why not? And then there are the late adopters who are very skeptical and very conservative in their thinking. And they need to see a very high level of evidence before they're willing to make a change or even consider making a change in, in their practice. And these changes, these dietary changes are so safe and so healthy. It doesn't make sense to me to wait. I think the risk is extremely low and the potential benefits are just huge. But I'm also um, having uh, consultation sessions with other clinicians around the world who are interested in learning about how to implement nutrition strategies in their clinical practice, Uh, forward thinking general practitioners and psychiatrists and nurse practitioners, and they tell me the same thing, that if they're working with people who are willing to change their diet, that they see improvements and sometimes really dramatic improvements. So we know that this works in the real world for many people who are willing to try it. Animals defend themselves with claws and fangs and growling and chasing. They don't need to have any other mode of protecting themselves. And so if you're going to eat an animal for lunch, you have to deal with all of those defense mechanisms and there's some risk involved. But if you're approaching a plant, it looks so innocent sitting there in a field. It looks defenseless. It looks vulnerable. It looks innocent, (laughs) but it's defending itself just as powerfully as any animal is. It's just doing it silently with invisible chemical weapons. And these have evolved over hundreds of millions of years. Because, you know, plants can't move, they would never have made it this far in evolution if they didn't protect themselves. So all creatures defend themselves. All creatures want to, you know, take over the world. (laughs) And so, and they especially want to protect their offspring. So plants have chemical weapons, many, many sophisticated ones. And some of the most powerful ones are found in the seeds of plants because seeds all contain embryos, grains, beans, nuts, and seeds are all seeds. And the seeds of plants are the most heavily defended because that's the future generation of the plant. So it makes sense that things, the sort of a paleo style diet, if you will, that removes grains and legumes may be a safer diet for human beings because there's so the lectins and phytic acid, lectins, which are, lectins are, um, they poke holes in animal cells and they provoke, they aggravate the immune system. And uh, seeds, all the seed foods are loaded with lectins. And seeds are also very high in phytic acid, which is a mineral magnet that interferes with our ability to absorb minerals from foods, things like 
zinc and iron and calcium and magnesium, which are crucial for brain function, very hard for us to absorb minerals from these foods. And so there are toxins in the cruciferous vegetables that can cause damage to cells. There are toxins. There are things called goitrogens in many types of foods, which interfere with iodine processing and thyroid hormone function. Toxins within nightshades. Nightshades are the tomatoes, eggplant family. So those foods, all the nightshades contain neurotoxins that some people are quite sensitive to. There isn't a plant in the world that doesn't defend itself with a chemical weapon. And these chemical weapons are really interesting. And of course, they're primarily designed to protect themselves from small creatures, you know, like worms and insects and bacteria and fungi. But our cells are made of the same stuff. (laughs) All animal cells are basically the same construction. So if you eat enough of these foods, or if you are vulnerable because you have gut damage or immune system damage, the plant foods that we've been eating for a long period of time, we have evolved defense mechanisms to deal with. We either don't absorb these toxins or we rapidly detoxify and eliminate them from the body. But if you have gut system or immune system damage, you may not do that as well as you should. And I think that helps to explain why people may tolerate plant foods for a long period of time, and then at some point in their life, they develop sensitivities and they no longer can handle a lot of plant foods. Very objectively, if you very dispassionately and rationally look at the science, it's really obvious that animal foods are are very healthy for us. And when I say animal foods, I I should clarify that I mean meat, seafood, and poultry. I think some people are sensitive to eggs, dairy. And so, I mean, eggs can be quite healthy, but not if you're sensitive to them. Unless you're looking at the epidemiology, which is just a strange kettle of fish, all the other fields of science line up beautifully to support our the necessity of animal foods in the human diet. Because only animal foods contain every nutrient we need in its proper form without any anti-nutrients. And you can't say that about any plant food. <laughs> all plant foods are lacking certain essential nutrients. All plant foods contain natural toxins and anti-nutrients. And there isn't anything you, you, that exists in a plant food that you can't get from an animal food. As far as I can tell, there's no necessity for plant foods if you're eating enough animal protein and fat. The more plants you eat, the harder it is for you to get nutrients, not just out of the plant foods that you're eating, but out of the animal foods that you're eating as well. If you want to be efficient about your nutrition and get everything you need without anything you don't need, if you follow the science to its logical conclusion, then Animal foods are all you need, and they are also the safest source of these nutrients, the the highest, most bioavailable. We absorb and utilize the nutrients in animal foods so much better in most cases than we do from plant foods. It's not that plants don't have nutrients. They do. It's just that many of them are on the wrong form, and many of them are harder for us to use because there are anti-nutrients that interfere. So like, are people eating a mixed diet with some animal foods and some plant foods? You know, most people will do okay with that. But as far as I can tell, the fewer plant foods you eat, the more nourished you will be. And if you don't eat enough animal foods, if you're eating a low animal food diet, particularly if you're eating a vegan diet, which contains no animal foods whatsoever, you will be lacking really important essential nutrients if you don't supplement very, very carefully. Unsupplemented vegan diet is dangerous. It's, it's an unsupplemented vegan diet is, is lethal. It's fatal. You can't survive on an unsupplemented all plant diet. In my consult service, regularly parents, you know, worried about their children who have decided to change to a vegan diet and they're not supplementing at all, at all. They don't have the information because a lot of people who promote plant based diets, they downplay, they minimize the risks rather than being transparent about them. And I think that's really dangerous. So I talk about DHA. And arachidonic acid. So DHA is an essential, DHA is an omega-3 fatty acid and arachidonic acid is an omega-6 fatty acid. And these are key fatty acids in the brain. So the fat of the brain is very high in both of these fatty acids. So we need both of them. In some circles, is not they're not considered essential because there are pathways that exist in the body to make them out of other things. So for example, we can make DHA from ALA. And ALA, alpha linoleic acid, is something you can find in plant and animal foods. So whether you eat plants or animals, you can get this ALA. Like it's in flax seeds, for example, but it's also in animal foods. And there is a pathway where you can turn ALA 
theoretically anyway, into EPA and DHA, which are omega-3 fatty acids that the body actually uses. We don't really use ALA. In many people, this pathway is unreliable. And, and you know, the studies vary. In some cases, 0% of the ALA gets turned into EPA and DHA. And in some cases, it's maybe 9% or more. It's on average less than 10%, and in some cases, 0%. So if you want DHA in your brain, you're taking your chances. If you're not eating DHA, which you can only find in animal foods, plant foods contain absolutely no DHA. Uh, there's a parent omega-6 fatty acid called linoleic acid, abbreviated LA. LA, again, this is in plants and animals, and there is this pathway that exists in cells where you can turn LA into arachidonic acid. And we need arachidonic acid for lots and lots of things, including brain function. So, but arachidonic acid itself, just like DHA, only exists in animal foods. When you look at the actual clinical trials where they, where they give people linoleic acid and they see how much arachidonic acid comes out the other side, it's virtually none. Like you can pour linoleic acid into somebody and their arachidonic acid levels in their blood will not budge. It just doesn't make any difference at all. And there's this question of, well, why doesn't this pathway seem to work? And if so, are people who eat a vegan diet walking around with no arachidonic acid in their blood? Well, they actually do have arachidonic acid in their blood. So somehow, it, some of it must be getting transformed, but we don't understand why we can't see this in the clinical studies. So again, you're taking your chances if you rely on plant foods to give you enough arachidonic acid. Indeed, it is critical for brain formation development of the human cortex during infancy. So I think it really makes a very strong case that human beings evolved to require animal fat in their diets. People who eat a plant-based diet are more likely to have B12 deficiency, their iron stores may be lower, and they're more likely to have omega-3 deficits, DHA and EPA, DHA in particular, which is very rich in the brain. They're more likely to have lower DHA levels, and they're more likely to have lower zinc levels. So when you look at these brain-healthy nutrients, these, these nutrients that the brain requires in order to function properly, you'll see that if you eat a plant-based, and by plant-based, I mean vegan diet, the vegetarian diet is a little bit better because it includes some animal foods like eggs and dairy. But if you eat a vegan diet, you're more likely to be deficient in some of these key brain nutrients. And we know that those deficiencies can lead to serious brain health problems. B12 deficiency is extremely dangerous for the brain. And iron deficiency is as well. Omega-3 deficiency is as well, particularly during the most critical years of brain development, which are from the third trimester of pregnancy to age two. So let's say, for example, that you're not getting enough of those nutrients when your brain is developing. There may be we don't have clinical trials that uh, it wouldn't be ethical to do this clinical trial. We don't know what some of the potentially irreversible damage uh, may be done uh, if you don't get enough of the nutrients when the brain is developing during that critical window of time. So again, that's a game of chance that you're playing. We don't know whether people who eat a vegan diet are at higher risk for mental health problems. We know that people who have these specific deficiencies are, but the interesting thing about the way we eat these days is that these deficiencies are not just found in people who eat a vegan diet. These deficiencies are very common. The ones that I listed are more common in people who eat a vegan diet, but people who eat a standard diet that includes animal foods, many of them are also deficient in iron. Like iron deficiency is very common. 10 to 20% of, of women in reproductive years are deficient in iron and iron is really important for the brain. So we have a lot of deficiencies and why? Even if you eat animal foods, why? Do you have deficiencies? Well, because I think this is, again, my hypothesis, we're eating too many foods that interfere with our ability to obtain, extract, utilize the nutrients in our food. Because if you're eating a lot of grains and a lot of beans, for example, which we're told should be the staple foods in our diet, you're eating a diet that's making it hard for you to get the minerals out of the foods you're eating. And if you're not eating enough animal foods, you're not getting enough B12. Or if you have gut damage, or if you're taking a medication, if you're taking, um, there are certain acid blockers that people take for ulcers and which make it difficult to process B12 and absorb it into the bloodstream. It's not enough to make sure you're eating the right foods. It's also really important to make sure you're not eating too many of the wrong foods.